murmuration could be several dozen starlings or several hundred, or even as many as a few thousand birds, all moving as though in unison, tracing these ethereal, ghostly shapes in the air. Now, the thing I find so fascinating about murmurations is, well, actually, all the things we don't know about them. Now, mechanically, they're relatively simple. When a neighbor moves, so do you. And that action cascades up from an individual bird's upward and outward to encompass the entire flock. Now, a murmuration often happens when starling, starlings gather in the evenings to roost, but occasionally it's a matter of self-preservation and defense. A murmuration might begin when a flock is actually under attack, when a falcon or some other predator draws near. But as for the name itself, murmuration, well, that's from the sound that the flock makes as it moves. The sound of a murmuration is like a quiet, gentle voice that's whispering to you across a great distance. Now, individually, starlings are beautiful, but collectively, starlings become a wonder. Now, I've been thinking a lot about starlings and their murmurations in recent years, especially as my design practice over the last few years has encompassed more and more work focusing on design systems specifically. And if you think about it, really, all the design systems work that we do is all about beauty rippling up from small, seemingly disconnected parts. I mean, we design these patterns, which are effectively little responsive layouts themselves, and we work to understand how they need to change and adapt across different breakpoints. And personally speaking, as a web designer, I love that my work has begun focusing on the small and then working up from that foundation. Because really, if you think about it, there's an incredible amount of beauty to be found in those details. If you'd like just one example of this, well, let's talk for just a moment about drop caps, one of my favorite things on the web. Now, I was assigned a bug report at some point in the previous like five or six months, dealing with the drop caps in a design system that I was working on at the time. Now, from these three screenshots, maybe you can see the issue already, but I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. So what we have here, this problem in a nutshell, and I'm just turning on borders to really highlight the issue. The alignment of these drop caps isn't consistent across these three browsers. Now, in Firefox, we have a nice tight box around the shape of our letter, and that's, in effect, what, the, uh, that's what we want to see happen. That's the visual effect we want to achieve. But unfortunately, Firefox is the outlier here. Chrome and Safari are sized consistently, but they're much too tall. There's extra space reserved at the top and bottom of the box, around the letter. So what's actually happening here? Well, if we look under the hood of this particular design pattern, we'll see a pattern of a different sort, a very common approach to creating drop caps on the modern web. Here, we're actually generating the drop cap with a fairly common bit of style uh, sheet code common bit of CSS called the first letter pseudo selector that allows us to select, wait for it, the first letter. <laughs> and then we style it, right? I mean, once we've actually chosen what we want to uh, highlight, we can then make it more prominent, we can float it off to the left, we can apply that nice, prominent, pleasing serif, and we can set the font size dramatically larger. Now bear with me for just one moment. If this is the common pattern, it's a little bit buggy, what happens if we change our approach just a little bit? What if we surround our first letter with a little bit of markup, a span more specifically, and then we style that? Now, I'll be the first to tell you, semantically this is not great. But just bear with me for a second. What happens if we go back to the browsers? Now that's interesting. Just by changing our approach slightly, by introducing that little bit of extra markup, all three browsers now have consistent sizing. They're all the exact same height. Now, we still have that other issue to deal with, right? We have this ungainly extra space above and below those letters. So our goal now is, now that we have this consistent sizing, can we close up that space and get that nice, tight grouping around the shape of our letter form? Now, it wasn't until I found a blog post by someone named Vincent de Oliveira that I actually figured out what was happening here and how to adjust the issue. You see, every glyph, every character, if you will, in a, in a typeface, is actually drawn on something called an M square. Now that's basically just a box that acts as a kind of coordinate plane that the letter form is then drawn upon. So that's the box that's actually being drawn for our drop caps, and that's what's making them appear too tall. 
because there's actually, in the M square itself, there's space reserved at the top and the bottom of the box, reserved for letter forms uh, ascenders or descenders. And those are the spaces that we actually need for our drop caps, which are going to be rendered in the capital uh, square. So in other words, for our drop cap, we basically want to remove those extra spaces that we won't need from the bounding box, leaving just enough room for our initial letter. And since we actually have introduced that span into our markup, we have a little bit of extra HTML to hook into, we can do exactly that. In other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the before and after pseudo selectors to target the areas before and after the letter, aha, and basically use negative margins to draw the letter up closer to the edges of the box, effectively erasing the spaces and closing up those gaps. So those negative margins are what's drawing the letter closer to the outer edges of the box, leaving us with the visual effect that we intended. And with that little bit of extra code, we're finished. But are we really finished? It's a very good question. I'm very sorry about that. Here's the thing. So we finished the visual treatment of this particular design pattern. We closed up the gap. We fixed the inconsistency. But we need to remind ourselves at every opportunity that on the web, we're not just serving sighted users. And there have been some really wonderful talks here just highlighting those issues from both Eric uh, and also from Lydia earlier today. We are, in everything that we do, designing and building for users who may not browse the web like you and I do, and who may not see the web like I do. So what does this design sound like, just as an example? Yeah, after we watched the storm, so beautiful yet terrific. So that's weird. We don't hear Matthew. We hear M, and then we hear the rest of the word, Athie. Yeah, after we watched the storm, so beautiful yet terrific. Now the reason this is happening is that some assistive technology, like VoiceOver that you may have heard, which is a screen reader on Mac OS and iOS, actually notices the markup that we added around that first letter and infers that it must be a completely separate word. So that's why we hear M, and then Athie. Yeah, after we watched the storm, so beautiful yet terrific. So instead of just focusing on the visual presentation of this design pattern, instead we need to go a little bit deeper and actually provide some code, some markup that better describes the information we're trying to deliver to our users while fixing this visual issue. And after some work and some experimentation, this is what we ended up with. Please lock the door someone, because I don't want you running to the exits when you see this. I will be the first person to tell you this is a lot to look at, right? And this seems like a lot. But really, amidst all this sort of like garbage looking HTML, there are really only two things that are happening. The first thing is that the thing that we're styling visual, the actual drop cap, we're treating as a purely visual element. So that ARIA hidden attribute is basically just signaling to every browser, every piece of assistive technology, that this is a purely visual element. It's not meant to be read aloud or interactive. So this is what's preventing that split word from being read aloud, for example, in a speaking browser. The second key component is that aria labeled by attribute, which surrounds the entire component. Now that points to the first real word, which is sort of buried inside the code, which is then set to display none with that little squelch glass I tossed on there. And thanks to that aria labeled by attribute on the container, this word acts as a kind of, well, label for this entire chunk of code. So voiceover and other assistive tech will simply read this whole chunk of markup as math. And now that we have some richer markup in place that properly describes this particular design pattern and the content within it, now we can consider our job done. We finally have a design that looks as good as it sounds. Matthew watched the storm, so beautiful yet terrific. Now I want to acknowledge something about this process. As the designer, these drop caps, I have an incredible amount of power throughout this entire design process. Now, I realize that power is not a word that we use in our industry very much. I mean, after all, we're all working web designers and engineers. It's, it's hard to think of ourselves as powerful, right? I mean, so much of our work on a daily basis is beholden to clients, to stakeholders, to deadlines, I mean, even to the needs of our products and their audiences. So in this context, what do I actually mean by power? Well, I think we can even start with a, a dictionary-grade definition. I mean, simply speaking, power is the ability to exert influence, to change behavior. Now, as I worked through these drop caps, that's exactly what I've done. 
the way in which I design this particular pattern quite literally influences who is going to be able to access my work and who gets a substandard experience, or even worse, who is actively excluded from accessing my design. Now this power applies to something as small as drop caps, but this was a moment for me to meditate on the fact that this power applies to quite literally everything we design and build on the web today. It is all too easy for us to design something that excludes people. Maybe our sites are too heavy and won't load for people that have limited data plans. Um, maybe someone actually needs assistive technology to simply access my work, and the thing that I've designed won't meet their needs. It doesn't matter if we don't mean to exclude someone, unfortunately. As my friend and colleague Deb Chatra once said, any sufficiently advanced neglect is indistinguishable from malice. We don't talk nearly enough as an industry about the power that we hold in the design that we implement. And I think part of the problem is that as an industry, the way in which we talk about web design as a concept is actually kind of flawed and, and problematic. We tend to talk about design, quote unquote, as something that's pure, as something that's apolitical. And unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. For one example of the ways in which power can influence design, I'd like to talk for a moment about a man named Robert Moses. Now, if you're not familiar with him, Moses was actually a massively influential public official in the middle of the 20th century in New York City. In New York State, excuse me. He was, among many other things, the New York City Parks Commissioner, and he oversaw countless public construction projects, like, for example, the Triborough Bridge, Shea Stadium, Flushing Meadows Park, which you may know is the site of two, New York's two world fairs. And Moses was actually instrumental in getting the United Nations to locate its headquarters in Manhattan. So he had a little bit of stuff under his belt over his tenure. In fact, Moses was known over the course of his career as the master builder of New York. During his tenure, he quite literally shaped New York's infrastructure, and much of his work can still be seen today. Moses was also an avowed racist. Now, Robert Caro, who was Moses' biographer, once said that Moses had always displayed contempt for people he felt were considerably beneath him. Now, I'm not going to um, quote the many terrible and uh, frankly vile things that Moses had said over the course of his career and his life. For that, I would actually recommend Caro's biography to you. But instead, I will note that many of Moses' public works projects were intentionally placed out of reach of New York communities that were predominantly black or Hispanic. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we look at just one example of Moses' work. This is one of the overpasses that Robert Moses built on the Long Island Parkway, and he built many, many overpasses. Now, Moses specified that the height of these overpasses must be low. Some with clearances as low as 7 feet, 7 inches. In fact, if I reach my hand up above my head, that should give you an idea of how short that distance is. So why so low? Well, Moses actually wanted to ensure that buses would never be able to pass beneath these overpasses. In other words, you could access the beautiful parks and beaches on Long Island if you owned a car, which in the middle of the 20th century meant that you were fairly affluent and almost certainly white. Moses' design of these under overpasses meant that if you relied on mass transit, in other words, if you were black or poor or both, you would be prevented from accessing the parkways and the lovely parks that they led to. Now, I wanted to talk about this because throughout history, there are many, many instances of design being used, much as Robert Moses did, as a means to encode racist and classist biases, as a vehicle through which vulnerable communities can be harmed. But that's enough about Robert Moses now, because now I'd like to show you a map. So this is a map of Cleveland, Ohio, and this map was actually drawn relatively recently, just a few short years ago, based on information collected by an American nonprofit, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Now the pink areas on the map represent communities where more than 35% of the population lives below the poverty line. The green areas of the map or where AT&T deployed high-speed fiber networks. If you spend any amount of time looking at this map, you'll notice that there's almost no overlap between those two areas. To put a finer point on it, in pursuit of profits, a 
business actually prioritize deploying its networks in areas of a city that would yield the greatest financial return. I want to suggest to you that this too is a kind of design. And functionally speaking, it's exactly the same as Robert Moses' work. It's enforcing structural institutional biases against the poor and excluding them from accessing the internet with the same ease and the same speed as other more affluent citizens. So I think it's critical for us as an industry, as professionals, that whether we're discussing Robert Moses, communication companies, or yes, even drop caps, I feel we need to sit with the fact that although design has a very, very rich history of providing solutions, it's also capable of visiting great harm upon people of packaging bias and of cementing existing inequalities. So that's why I think it's critical for us to look at design as an agent of power, of something that's, yes, absolutely capable of doing great good, but just as capable of doing great harm as well. Even if we don't mean to do it in our work, our work can privilege the privileged and exclude marginalized populations. So we have to talk about the power that we possess as designers and developers or product owners, and then we have to wield that power responsibly in quite literally everything that we do on a daily basis. Now the reason I wanted to talk with you a little bit about power today is because I feel like something dramatically has shifted, even just in the last few years in our industry. Just as a few quick examples of this, I'd like to look at a few things that some of the industry's most successful companies did over the course of last year, more specifically just in 2018. Let's start right at the top with Amazon. Now, in May of 2018, it was discovered that Amazon had actually developed its own facial recognition software called Recognition, get it? And had actually begun selling recognition to law enforcement agencies across the United States. Additionally, in last November, it was discovered that Amazon had filed a patent in by which its ring doorbells, which have a camera embedded in them, could use that self-same recognition software to alert homeowners and police of suspicious activities and people. This despite the fact that the recognition software was tested by the American Civil Liberties Union to have identified over two dozen members of the U.S. Congress as criminals. <laughs> many of whom were actually people of color. And next, we come to Google. In May of last year, it was discovered that Google was attempting to bid on contracts for the United States Pentagon, and specifically for something called Project Maven. Google was specifically bidding to provide artificial intelligence capabilities that could interpret video images, which could in turn be used to improve the targeting of drone strikes. Shortly thereafter, actually, various internal leaks started to surface about something called Project Dragonfly, which was a secret initiative to create a censored and trackable version of Google's search tool for, uh, for use and release in China. This initiative was immediately and roundly condemned by human rights organizations across the globe, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And according to an open letter signed by that coalition, and I quote, if such features were launched, there is a real risk that Google would directly assist the Chinese government in arresting or imprisoning people simply for expressing their views online, making the company complicit in human rights violations. And on that front, let's turn briefly to Facebook. In the last year, Facebook had a number of massive user data breaches, some of which you might actually remember. And as you also may know, more revolution came out about use of the platform for coordinated political attacks. But I want to focus on something that was released in September of last year, where United Nations human rights investigators issued a report stating that Myanmar's military had targeted its population of Rohingya Muslims with mass killings and gang rapes with, and I quote, genocidal intent, end quote. And in that same report, it said that Facebook had been instrumental in facilitating that campaign and that hatred. They said that the role of social media is significant. Facebook has been a useful instrument for those seeking to spread hate in a context where, for most users, Facebook is the internet. Well, I don't know about you folks, but it's really easy for me to look at the last year's events, or even events that are happening much more recently, and just kind of feel despair. I mean, because this doesn't feel like the industry I grew up in, I don't know about you, but the web feels just a little bit darker now. 
And this is a really stark contrast to how I got started in this industry, because especially in the earliest years of the web, much of the way that we talked about our medium was a kind of like techno-optimism. I hate saying that word out loud. But, uh, I mean, maybe you remember this one particular moment, and this is taken from the 2012 Olympics. Here's the culmination of this sequence, 1400 volunteer cars paying tribute to this man, really. Because he's the one who changed the way we all communicate today. Conversely, the British scientist who invented the World Wide Web created the first website in the world in 1990. This is for everyone. This should give you some indication of how much fun I am at parties. When I saw this happen live, I stood up and cheered in my living room. <laughs> um, but this, at least for me, was kind of representative of how we used to talk about the web. I mean, there was something magical about this moment back in 2012, at least for me. That Sir Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the World Wide Web, was standing in front of the world, or sitting, I guess more specifically, and proclaiming that this thing he created, that this was for everyone. And it epitomized the way that we thought about the web, especially in its early years, that this wasn't just a communications network, this was an ideal. There was this open, free, universally accessible network that would connect people across the globe, and given time, it would actually improve the world. But I don't actually feel that ideal much anymore, not these days. Now, it, it might just be me, because I mean, I've, I've, I've become an old man in this industry, let's be clear. But I don't think it is just me. I really feel there's been a big shift in the last five or six years. The web I grew up in looks very different, very different, from the web as it stands today. But here's the thing that's been helpful for me. We got to this point, this admittedly low point, in part because the web's evolution has been following a different kind of pattern. Now, not a design pattern, mind you, it's a historical pattern, one that's very old and very well structured. And it's a pattern that has a profound effect on the web, on our industry, on our work, and yes, I would actually argue on us. And if we can understand that pattern, that's going to go a long way to helping us understand how we got here, and maybe more importantly, how we might possibly begin to move forward. So let me ask you this. Um, are any of you familiar with Ursula Franklin? Okay, a couple, couple of shy hands. This is a safe pivot. Okay, all right. Anyway, Ursula Franklin is, if you're not familiar with her, she is remarkable, frankly. She was a metallurgist, a, a physicist, a university professor, a writer, a feminist, a social critic, a social historian, and, I mean, just generally one of the most inspiring and accomplished people I've ever heard of. And among everything else that she did over the course of her life and her career, she's actually responsible for writing one of my very, very favorite books. It's titled The Real World of Technology. It's really good. Um, it's one of those books that I wish I'd read at the very beginning of my career, and it's, it's a remarkable look at technology, not as an abstract concept, but more specifically as a kind of social force, one that actually shapes people's lives. Now, the book is, is very wide-ranging, and it's incredible. It's, it's a great read. I can't recommend it enough. But among everything else that she puts forward in the book, Franklin suggests that every technology, Every technology ages in the exact same fashion, passing through three distinct stages of development, each marked by the technology's relationship to the society as a greater whole. Now, if I was going to presume to slap titles on each one of these really well-articulated ages, I think you could break them down like this. Advocacy, adoption, and institutionalization. Now, the first stage is the one where technology is first introduced to a society. And now, in this phase, you know, everything is exciting and new. Technology offers a solution to all of life's drudgeries and cares. Early adopters explain how wonderful that technology will be and try to engender a real sense of excitement around it. Now, all that optimism and that advocacy lays the sound, uh, groundwork for widespread adoption. And that brings us to the second phase, which is what happens as the technology begins to gain traction society. As more people use the technology, standards become established, and the infrastructure is put in place to support and preserve that new technology. The third phase is what happens when technology uh, crosses a sort of adoption threshold, and it achieves an institutional status. 
Now, at this stage, the technology is no longer optional. In fact, it's an expectation, a necessity. The standardization process results in economic consolidation with control over the technology being held by a relatively small number of powerful partners. And at this point, the technology can become so stabilized that it becomes stagnant. I mean, if it changes at all, the changes might be minor at best. But here's the important thing to note about this three-step trajectory. That as the technology matures over time, that promise of liberation that's made in the first phase is never, ever fulfilled. Here's one example that Franklin cites in her book. It's from an article that's written, keep this in mind, in 1860. The sewing machine will, after some time, effectively banish ragged and unclad humanity from every class. In all benevolent institutions, these machines are now in operation and do, or may do, 100 times more towards clothing the indigent and feeble than the united fingers of all the charitable and willing ladies collected through the civilized world could possibly perform. Now, just to lay a little bit more context around this quote, the sewing machine was introduced to the public in the middle of the 19th century. When it was made commercially available, it was advertised as an appliance that would free women from the routine drudgery of hand sewing. You'll notice they're actually doing much more in this particular quote. In fact, the authors of this article claim that the sewing machine would end poverty. This was written in 1860, mind you. The sewing machine didn't quite capitalize on those promises. Poverty is sadly still going very strong. But hype aside, the sewing machine's greatest innovation wasn't actually in the domestic side, in the home. Because a few short decades later, if you contrast that article with this pamphlet for a Singer sewing machine, which advertised that a female operator could use it to produce 3,300 stitches per minute. So that's interesting. As the technology improved, the messaging shifted from personal liberty to technological efficiency. Why does that change happen? Well, let's put this in context as well. Because at this time, the sewing of clothing was being done at a truly industrial scale for the very first time. And that work was actually being done in factories and in sweatshops that exploited the labor of women and of immigrants. So this industrialization of clothing actually required a classic division of labor. One seamstress would only sew up sleeves. Another worker would sew the sleeves to the shirt. Another worker would cut buttonholes, and yet another worker would press the finished shirts. But over time, as the industry evolved, as the technology matured, each of those tasks, the sewing, the cutting, the pressing, they became increasingly automated, excluding people altogether. And this is what Franklin was arguing, that in every technology's history, people have promised that that technology will free them. But ultimately, as the technology matures, it captures them. It exploits them. I'd like to propose that what happened with the sewing machine is currently happening with the World Wide Web. But the web is becoming industrialized in the same way that the sewing machine was. And it's following the exact same pattern that Ursula Franklin outlined in her book. In fact, there's a great example of this in the mission statement of the Web Foundation, which you may know is the nonprofit organization that Sir Tim Berners-Lee founded to advocate for an open, free web. The mission statement says, we envision a world where all people are empowered by the web. The web's capabilities will multiply and play an increasingly vital role in reducing poverty and conflict, improving health care and education, reversing global warming, spreading good governance, and addressing all challenges, local and global. I don't think we have to squint too hard to see how these statements resonate with the introduction of the sewing machine. Not only will the web make it easier to find, publish, and locate information online, but it will reduce poverty, improve health care, and reduce global warming. Now, I don't want to stand up here in terrible shoes and deny the web's potential. I mean, it is a truly revolutionary medium. I firmly believe that. And on a personal note, it gave me a career, and chances are going to give me one too. But I think it's worth asking ourselves that if this is the promise of the World Wide Web, where do things stand now? Has that promise been fulfilled? Well, let's start small. And I'd like to tell you two short stories. The first is a story about Jade. Now, Jack, Jade is a black woman in her mid-20s, and she recently moved to New York and has spent the last few years trying to get a job in the tech industry. 
Now, Jade doesn't have a college degree, which has made her search difficult, to say the least, but Jade is also one of the smartest people I know. I mean, she taught herself HTML and CSS while holding down several part-time jobs. But even still, her lack of formal education and training has made it incredibly difficult for her to get job interviews, much less to get um, job offers. Now, in happier news, Jade actually recently got a job working in customer support for an internet startup, and her day includes like fielding emails and phone calls from the company's customers, and she'll be the first to tell you that this is nothing too glamorous, but she feels like she's finally got her foot in the door of the tech industry. She's happy about that. Um, I've known Jade all her life. Jade's my sister. She hates this photo. <laughs> um, anyway, I was thinking about Jade last May when Duplex took the stage at last year's Google I.O. conference. And from that stage, Duplex made two phone calls. And here's a short excerpt of the first one, in which you can hear Duplex booking an appointment at a hair salon. Because none of this was an accident. 
hiring low-cost labor to perform rote, repetitive work every single day. This is something that was intentionally and thoughtfully done. And more specifically, by opening offices in countries uh, in, and in impoverished communities, where wages are low, where labor protections are presumably non-existent, this company and their corporate clients can maximize their gains and minimize their costs at the same time. And just think for a moment about how precarious Jen Brenda's job actually is. As image recognition technology improves, is her job still going to exist in a few years' time? And it's entirely possible that the data work she's doing today is being fed into automated solutions that will eventually replace her, which is, for better and for worse, a very common strategy today in our industry. For one example of that strategy, we can look again at Facebook. And modern social media companies struggle with content moderation. If you've ever wondered how you can get through most of a day online without seeing truly disturbing content, it's thanks to the efforts of thousands of contract workers. Now, each of those workers sorts through videos, through images, through posts, each of them basically searching for anything that might potentially violate the company's terms of service. I want to be very clear that this is terrible, stressful, and traumatic work that's visited upon an army of unseen and low-paid contractors. More recently, Facebook has been investing in various automated approaches for flagging explicit content. And to do so, they've begun gathering data from their human reviewers and using that data to train algorithms. Our industry has a very rich history of doing exactly this, of treating certain classes of work as invisible and as ideal candidates for automation. And those workers are forced to train the algorithms that may replace them at some point. So in other words, this is what automation has created at the corners of our industry. That the automated solutions we design are responsible both for creating exploitative working conditions for vulnerable workers, but they're also responsible for displacing and eliminating jobs. So here's the thing I want to suggest to you today, right now, is that it's not just happening in the corners anymore. More specifically, that our jobs, yours and mine, are just as vulnerable to these same effects of automation. Now, personally speaking, I don't feel that this is an especially controversial suggestion. Our industry has always embraced automation as a good uh, at various levels, from the task runners that you and I use in our work to something that's happening on a much broader scale like the work that's happening over at Netflix. They've begun delivering personalized artwork recommendation on the movie, uh, movies that you browse in their catalog. So for example, the cover image might change, for example, if you've seen a whole bunch of romantic comedies, the cover artwork for Good Will Hunting might feature Matt Damon and Minnie Driver more prominently. However, if you tend to prefer comedies, Robin Williams might be the key art in that photograph. Now, the way that they're able to deliver this level of extreme personalization is um, Netflix created Ava, which is the name that they use to apply to a suite of complex tools and software. Basically, Ava uses facial detection and image analysis algorithms to scour videos for frames that have cinematic qualities, and then using those images and feeding them into another set of algorithms that can then recommend the best rubber they think you're going to like based on various profile markers, your geography, and so on. It's really stunning work and almost entirely automated. The thing about this is that this is a major driver for Netflix to produce this software in the first place. It's automated quality. They said that as our original content slate continues to expand, our technical experts are tasked with finding new ways to scale our resources and alleviate our creators from the tedious and ever-increasing demands of digital advertising. And I think this line spells it out pretty clearly. And that brings me to a video that I saw even more recently, generated by the design systems team at Airbnb. Now this video is very, very brief, but a number of things actually happen in it. Now in the video, a designer places a sketch where they sketch a few shapes on a piece of paper. They then place that paper underneath a camera where a computer analyzes the sketch, and then it instantly renders a finished prototype in a browser with actual HTML and CSS. It creates a real design simply by looking at a sketch on a piece of paper. And now it's able to do so because every single shape that's on the paper actually corresponds to a specific design pattern in the Airbnb pattern library. From an engineering perspective, this is brilliant, and on a personal level, I've always dreamed of something like this, of being able to perfectly and instantly represent my ideas in a browser. And now that it's here, I can't help but be a little bit scared of it.
please don't misunderstand me. This technology is a marvel, and it's one that could be a real aid to me in my work. But the more that I watch this video, I can't help but think of all the jobs that traditionally sit between a sketch and a finished prototype. Of all the designers, the developers, the researchers, the people involved in translating a rough idea into working shipping code. And I wonder what this prototype means for them. For us. For you and me. So I think here's the way of it. Over the last few years, our industry has made countless ethical and moral lapses into the pursuit of scale. And with that scale comes a precariousness amongst its workers, among warehouse workers and contractors and administrators, but also for you and me, the working digital professionals. So given that, I'd like to put three suggestions in front of you. That we are workers who make our living on the web. As workers, we should have a voice in saying how our work is meant to be used. And as workers, we should have a voice in saying how automation is incorporated into our work. So keeping that in mind, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is what do we do about this? Well, I think before we do anything else, we have to start with hope. And I'd like to share, I, I realize we're coming up on time, but I'd like to share a bit of one of my favorite speeches by Cornell West, who's a philosopher here in America. I don't believe in optimism. I don't believe in pessimism. Black folks saying I've been down so long that down don't worry me no more, but I'll keep struggling anyway. That is not an optimistic statement nor a pessimistic statement. It's neither sentimental nor cynical. It's an expression of hope, and hope is not the same thing as optimism. Never confuse or conflate hope with optimism. Hope cuts against the grain. Hope is participatory. It's an agent in the world. Optimism looks at the evidence to see whether it allows us to infer that we can do X or Y. Hope says, I don't give a damn, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite moments in a lecture that's just brilliant. I can't recommend it enough. Um, now, just to be clear, Professor West is speaking from and within a very specific context here. Uh, that of struggling against the racial inequalities that black Americans face on a daily basis. And I want to acknowledge that context, and I want to honor that context. With that said, I do feel his definition of hope in that context can also be useful for us here in this moment in our industry. That hope is participatory. It's an agent in the world. And in these times, I think it's actually very important for us to distinguish hope, that moment of action, from simply feeling optimistic or feeling hopeful. We have so many challenges in front of us, that's true, and it's easy to look at those challenges and to feel overwhelmed and to feel despair. But it's also critical for us to recognize that we have just as many opportunities to take action, to redesign our industry to be more equitable and to be more just. But we need power to do it. We also need to recognize that individually we lack that power. No single one of us can change Facebook's trajectory, or Google's, or Amazon's. And in fact, we're not unlike starlings in our way. We're beautiful, and we've done so many clever and mischievous things. But we are small. We're almost insignificant. But collectively, I think that's another matter entirely. After all, it's our design thinking, our engineering, our planning, our research, our work that has quite literally made the web as it is today. Collectively, we have designed and built so many of these systems. When we work together, when we move together, what is to stop us from redesigning those same systems? We need to unionize, my loves. Now, just to be clear, I don't mean this in an abstract sense or as a, as a metaphor. I mean this quite literally, that we should recognize that we're not just web designers or engineers, that we are workers. And as workers, we have an opportunity, if not potentially an obligation, to organize our workplaces and to form unions. Now, just to be clear, a union means different things in different countries, and in ours it means something very different from the rest of the world also. But fundamentally, a union provides power and leverage to its workers. It allows workers to negotiate with employees for better wages, better working conditions, better benefits. And all that is true and necessary. Maybe even more critically, a union allows us to express solidarity with every worker in our organizations, and not just designers and developers, but also administrators, cafeteria workers, and administrators, uh, contractors as well. 
and it helps to ensure that we're working collectively to protect each other. Now, if you'd like for one of the most visible examples I've seen recently of an organized workplace in the tech industry, you don't actually have to look much further than a little upstart called Google. Now, you may remember that last year, last, um, there was a litany of bad news for Google. There was their foray into defense contracting with Project Maven, and then there was that news of Project Dragonfly, their censored and trackable search engine for release in China. And then, in late October, the New York Times reported that Google had protected three executives accused of sexual misconduct, including Andy Rubin, the founder of Android. Now, according to the reporting, rather than firing the executives, Google paid each of them millions of dollars upon the departure, even though they were not legally required to do so. We gotta finish. You gotta finish? Okay, great. 